This was the estate sale of the decade. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogley's Guitar Show. So a few viewers of the show sent me links to these two different estatesales.net auctions being held in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And they had all kinds of cool stuff for Gibson and Heritage and a few other brands. The descriptions never really gave us a name, but our first auction did have a shirt that said Hutch. So I was thinking maybe for some reason this is Hutch's stuff. His family was just selling off some of his old items. That's how I got the Gibson map guitar, you know, the one used in the promo shop. However, it was the part two sale that gave us the full information. This was Maudie Moore's stuff. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I even knew her name before this, and it saddens me deeply to not have known her name and what she did for so many brands until her estate sale. And it just absolutely pains me of how cheap some of this stuff went. Due to the very poor handling of this, most of these items were done as closed bids, also sometimes called a seal bid. It's to ensure a fair and open competition where buyers can say, I'm going to pay this much, and then whoever said I'm going to pay the most at the end of the day gets to pay it. Whereas I I much prefer open bidding because it creates a transparent process that I feel is much more fair. You can see how much other people are bidding, so you can bid more than that. That's the way eBay does. And if your max bid is like way over everybody else, you're only going to pay whatever amount over the next highest bid. I think it's the most fair process. So with this being kind of a smaller estate sale, you just didn't really know how much to bid. But look at this, Kalamazoo, Michigan, Made in USA, Sweet 16, I believe both of these are more so heritage items. Over here it says Merle Travis, but do you see what this is? D, the Les Paul. Over here we've got some Cumberland and another one of those Kalamazoo, Michigan ones. We've got a giant Elvis Presley in a four-piece stencil. We've got the Heritage Eagle in a two-piece. You've got the Gibson Citation, West Montgomery, D'Angelico stuff, Barney Kessel, Howard Roberts, Tal Farlow, Gatorgan stuff, the Gibson Crest model, the Gibson Special, you've got the Gibson Banjo Styles, there's the Howard Roberts Artist, a mandolin headstock cutout, the Hummingbird Pick Guard, Merle Travis, and Super 400 Tailpieces. I might be saying, hey, okay, this is all well and good, but what exactly is this stuff? It's the stencils used to make the engravings using the pentagraph machine. So Maudie Moore first started to work for Gibson in 1964, and if we can believe this plaque over here, she probably officially left Gibson around 1980, but she started her own Moore's engraving in Kalamazoo in 1972. So that way she could work for more companies than just Gibson. So when I first ran into this auction, I didn't really know what this stuff was, and I I hadn't pieced together things yet that this came from Maudie Moore's estate. So I thought, okay, are these just like homemade brass signs and whatnot? Because they look so much larger than the engravings on the guitar. But the way the pantograph machine works is you use a stencil that is twice as large as what you engrave, and the machine mirrors what you're moving onto the stencil. So obviously, since I'm a big fan of the V Les Paul, I was very interested in this piece. That is probably what was used to engrave every single V Les Paul truss rod cover, whether it be the brass ones or the wooden ones. But again, being close bids, I didn't know, are, are people offering 20 bucks on this? Are they offering 100? Do they know what it is? So I was absolutely gutted when I found out this piece sold for 500 bucks. I probably would have paid dollars if the bidding really got fierce enough. They left so much money on the table. So for the rest of tonight's episode, we're just going to go through everything that was sold in both of the current two auctions. So over here, this is the Gibson flower pot. Sometimes you'd find that on some headstocks. I know the L5 likes to use just the flower headstock, and then depending on the era is when you'd get that logo, and also banjos will use that. Here is the actual Super 400 tailpiece. You know, all those fine etchings and engravings that you see on them normally. Apparently this is how those were done. And a lot of these are labeled even. So this is the 1981 reissue, Merle Travis S400. And over here, here's a heritage stencil for one of their banjos. Next up, looks like more heritage stuff. That's a beautifully flamed pit guard. Then she was probably the one that put the spaceship in it. But these just appear to be headstock blanks. But she had a whole bunch of bridges left over. But on top of that, there was a lot of tone woods that you could have bought here. Now, I don't really know anything about those. But 50 bucks for a whole stack of fretboards seems like a pretty good deal to me. But they had a couple of original dove pit guards over here. New old stock pit guard over here. These headstock veneers are really cool. So this is one of the RD Artist guitars that didn't have the inlays put in it yet. That's really cool. I've never seen that. 
Then we got one of the old banjo necks and some top parts of acoustics. This looks like an L5 template to cut out the F holes. Would be an educated guess. They had some nice clues and tuners, 20 bucks. And ah, man, one of those things. It's basically a little toolbox. These things actually show up on eBay quite often. They're not worth too much if they're empty, but if they have all the replacement parts still in them, they can be very valuable. And, oh man, that's really cool too. The dimensions of your peg head veneers. And this appears to be some sort of a diagram for a fretboard. Oh, I never even saw this the first time. 30th anniversary gold tops from 1982. Stuff like that is so cool. How do you value that? It's up in the air. That's why an open auction would have been great because you would have got bidding wars. But that's cool. If only in a historical preservation way, not necessarily monetary value. And the first sale had some interesting guitars. Do you see what this is? It made me wonder if it was some sort of a weird prototype, because this body shape is nothing necessarily Gibson. It almost reminds me of a Victory style guitar, though. And then you've got a Flying V style headstock with an unusual truss rod cover. But look at your electronics. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's a Marauder's electronics. So if they were only asking like 200 bucks for the weird tiny guitar, just the electronics in that thing is probably worth about 600 to somebody trying to restore a Marauder to original. Then we had an intricately inlaid gingerbread man truss rod cover on this guitar. Not sure if that's what they were going for, but that's what it kind of looks like. But you've got inlays within your inlays. That thing is just very fancy. And then she had this beautiful mandolin within her collection. There was a really cool Gibson nylon jacket, the American made world played. That would have looked so good hanging up right behind the map guitar. There's a Hamer shirt, custom art historic branding. So that tells you you're within the 90s. But here was a Gibson Custom Shop jacket. That's kind of cool because that's after her initial time working with the company. But the way I understand it is she still continued to do contract work for Gibson for a long time. How long? Unfortunately, I don't exactly know. Finding hard concrete info online at this point in time is a little bit tough. Gibson just has a history of not necessarily naming their craftsmen behind everything. They're starting to get a little bit better with that. But I've always felt Fender has celebrated their artisans behind the scenes a bit better, especially with the custom shop master builders. They publicly name them. You always see that in the for sale ads. Their name is attached to it. But there are also some cool books. If you find one of these, the Gibson story, you can get like a hundred bucks for them if they're in good condition. But then we've got a bunch of cool like 80s style the heritage. I would assume these are spec sheets, at least that's the way Gibson is. You turn them around and then you would see something like that. But I'd never heard of a heritage terminator before. <laughs> Strange, like this is a some sort of a star shape. But they just had a whole bunch of cool stuff like that if you're into heritage. And knowing what I know now, we could have known whose estate this was right away. And there were also non-guitar related things, pillows, fabrics, towels, cool guitar lights. And that's just what they took photos of of the first sale. But now let's go to sale two. So we already kind of talked about some of these pantograph stencils. The only other one I was really interested in owning was the Crest because the Crest model is kind of cool. It would kind of tie in with my The Hippo, which was a later Nam show creation than the original Crest models. But they had a whole bunch of these Super 400 tail pieces. And the first day, they were all full price. I think they wanted like 125 or something like that. We'll see that a little bit later. But then the second day, it was 50% off. Third day, 75% off. Everything easily moved. But here's back to that pile. Some of the stuff wasn't just for bidding. I don't know how they decided what they should bid on and what should not be but you see what this is les paul artist i would have happily paid a couple hundred bucks for that over here rd standard bass here's the one for the dove the 70s font style that's cool rd custom just imagine what else might be in here i was telling you earlier they had wood and when i say they had wood they had tons of it i don't know what kind of conditions this was stored in but you've got a whole bunch of fretboards here like i would have been interested in one of these in case like a les paul artisan inlay pops out <laughs> then you have a nice replacement assuming they're the same size anyway here's a bunch more fretboards there's even more wood over here this particular piece <laughs> looks awesome i'm sure she was saving that for a special day and then they had a lot of laminate tops i mean this is what it looked like stacked all the way up right here by her garage door the other thing I was interested in is I'd never seen this before. So usually the 80s packaging for Schaller's kind of looks something similar to this, also into the 90s, but I'd never seen a Gibson branded version one. The 80s Gibson packaging looked completely different. It was blue like these, but this is definitely the Schaller M6 style with the Gibson branding. So that would have been nice to have at least picked up one of those. They had a bunch of these fancy tail pieces that hadn't quite been engraved yet. A bunch of shrinking celluloid material pickguard stuff. A bunch of pre-cut inlays. We'll see how cheap those were in a second. 
And then the tools. The tools would have been cool to have because these things helped make history. There were also some guitar books. Lots of memorabilia. I truly regret not taking the four hour drive to check this out, but I just didn't know how much would be left on day two. They should have took this to a more professional auction service rather than just trying to get it out right away. I'm sure even Gibson would have considered purchasing a lot of this. But here is a cool Fantasy Camp 2003 shirt. That's towards the end of using this logo. It's only got a couple years left. But here's a cool Heritage Clock. That's another fun old logo Gibson t-shirt. I really like that one. That's totally 80s. <laughs> Play the legend. The Les Paul by Gibson. And a more modern Gibson custom shop logo shirt. Lottie's pink one. And then even her own branded shirt. There was lots of good vintage clothing as well. Ah, one of these cool Gibson hats. So apparently this was a promotional thing. You see them pop up on Reverb occasionally for like 200 bucks. I don't know how much this one was. But somebody had told me the story one time that Gibson reps would come around and like hand these hats out. I'm not sure I'm fully remembering that correctly, but I do want one of those for my collection because it's just cool. Then again, some more personal items. Jewelry. Watches. Lots of jewelry. Lots of watches. But it was these photos that made me go, all right, my kids might be good if I actually go to this because they've got troll dolls and other little things that might have been able to keep their attention, especially these Barbies. Kind of a creepy panda-like doll over there. And oh, is that one of those doodle on it bears? I remember those. Bunch of old vintage games and a whole bunch of yarn and other fabric related materials. Oh yeah, and you got some vinyl. I'm sure there were a couple of guys that knew exactly what this stuff was, but the rest of the internet didn't get to it. So maybe in some ways that's good, but I really feel bad for the family in this situation that they gave this treasure trove of history away for, for almost nothing on some of these. So those are the items they took photos of, but if you actually went to the My House to Your Home Instagram page, you could get a slight walkthrough tour where it wasn't necessarily filmed the best, but you could see some other things. For example, this Gibson sign here looks pretty cool, but here were tons of headstock veneers. We saw that bare one, but here's one that has the inlays, and it looks like maybe they were asking 50 bucks a pop. Those are easily worth $200 on eBay. It just takes a little bit of time to sell them, but those look like real holly veneers. Those were a great deal, and there was tons of them. They all look Gibson too. Somebody probably just picked up the whole stack and took them home. And then we had these interesting clamps over here. I'm not exactly sure what they were for, but they were five bucks a pop. But here's what I was talking about, tons of wood. You can just see all these blanks that they've got going on for the bodies and other things. And those are looking like neck blanks potentially with some fretboards. But there's some laminate tops that they would use on like 335s. Then over here, you've got tons of binding. But this guitar room would have been a lot of fun. Here's where those fretboards were. There was a different Kalamazoo, Michigan sign over here. Find some other literature that we didn't see before. There's some Super 400 inlay fretboards, just a whole bunch of stuff here. But a hundred bucks for that top seems kind of cheap. I never got to see how much my tuners were. But it looks like these tailpieces were about 75 a pop. But remember, if they didn't sell right away, they went down by 50 to 75%. I would assume something like that's worth at least 150 on the internet. But I'm not exactly familiar with that particular version. But right here was really cool. Those are Gibson case tags. In the mid-70s, some of the cases would have that badge right here. It was kind of a shortly lived spec. Oh, and then there were these really cool price guides from the mid-80s that also have my map guitar on it. I would have loved to have picked those up. Again, that's one of those items I'm not really going to pay a lot of money for but they're just cool to have as memorabilia and this item was pretty cool potentially 75 bucks for Maudie's personal stamp sounds like a good deal to me then just hats 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 galore but would you look at that 125 bucks for all that pearl inlay I feel like that was a really good deal but then again I don't buy pearl inlay all that often but there were some more super 400 tail pieces you can see the price tag right there and some more of those case tags I was talking about and oh my goodness, it did. It did have a price tag, 25 bucks. I would have paid like 250 plus for that in an auction situation. And only $3 for an engraved Maudy Moore? Come on, guys. And it's not necessarily just about the money. I just want to make sure it's going to a home that fully appreciates it. And it's not just going to get flipped on eBay or something, which unfortunately I, I think might be the case for a lot of this stuff. So if you missed out, watch eBay, watch Reverb, you might see this. So I dedicate this video to Maudie. I wish I would have known about her existence and what she did for Gibson before she passed. 
but unfortunately we were just a couple of years. I could have drove up and met her, but thankfully the NAMM show website documented some of her tale as well as M Live. So I'll link all that in the description. But just so you guys know, there is a part three to this auction apparently, and it's going to be like all the machinery she used. Now that's going to be kind of a niche thing, but if you're interested in that, watch the estate sales.net and I'm sure they'll post another one very soon. It's in Kalamazoo, Michigan. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.